One of the many opportunities we have for the Eisenhower Institute is that we are able to give students a glimpse into the world that awaits them. The world needs learners and leaders with the passion and capacity to contribute to society. Conversations Beneath the Cupola is a Gettysburg College podcast where we bring attention to the great work of our students, faculty, and alumni who are doing just that. Hi, I'm Bob Giuliano, president of Gettysburg College and your host. Today, we are joined by the chairman emerita of the Eisenhower Institute at Gettysburg College, Susan Eisenhower. Susan is an author, an international policy consultant, an expert on international security, space policy, energy, and relations between the Russian Federation and the United States of America. She is also the granddaughter of President Dwight Eisenhower. Susan, welcome and thank you for joining me today. You have been such a good friend to Gettysburg College and have such a broad perspective on the world, the politics, presidency, international relations. Really thrilled to have you here today and talking about a set of topics that I think matter to the college and I think more broadly. Early days here at Gettysburg for me, but one of the things that has really impressed me is the Eisenhower Institute and what it does for our students and what it does more broadly, I think, in helping to talk about topics that need to be talked about. And I've spent some time in my early days also trying to think about how the history of this place speaks to the values that we have as a community and to our future as well. So I'm really excited about the Eisenhower Institute. I find it truly inspiring. And I think you know this from the conversations we've had. But not everybody knows what the Eisenhower Institute is. Would you say a word or two to the people who are listening so they'll have a sense of what I find so engaging about this place? Well, there's a wonderful history of the Eisenhower Institute. It's what uh, I would call uh, an Eisenhower legacy organization. It was founded, actually, I was one of the um, uh, founding directors, but it was founded by a number of my grandfather's close associates who had been on his staff during the White House years. And at first, uh, we conceived of it as an organization to give away scholarships, and, and of course, we do that. But it suddenly took on a more dynamic nature because we saw that things were changing in the world, and we had an opportunity to address those changes, both in Washington and also through an affiliation with Gettysburg College, which we established in the uh, 1990s. Why Gettysburg? Well, there were long associations between Dwight Eisenhower and, and Gettysburg College. And I think those associations were something we could see we could leverage to bring along rising generations, which of course is critically important for the future, not only of our country, but of the global community. And we were doing a lot of um, very specific policy work in Washington, but we always wanted this affiliation that would make it possible to bring students into some of our activities. Then years later, things shifted, and the Eisenhower Institute, Eisenhower World Affairs Institute, as it was known then, uh, merged with Gettysburg College. So what you had suddenly was a kind of a, a change of gravity, you might say. The gravity shifted to, to Gettysburg College, but the, the same wonderful dynamic interaction between Gettysburg and the Washington community is, is still there. And it is powerful and very exciting. Um, not everyone will understand your grandfather's connection to Gettysburg College. If you walk in front of our admissions office, you see a very nice sculpture of him looking out over Carlisle Street. But say a word or two about that and also your uh, connections to Gettysburg. Oh, well, uh, those those connections go way back. Uh, Ike, if I may call him that. Um, He's was your the, grandfather. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> was uh, commanding the U.S. Tank Corps here at uh, Gettysburg during the First World War. And he was just about to deploy to the, the front uh, in France when uh, the armistice was called. And so he did not get to the front in France, but he certainly uh, trained people in this uh, exotic new technology, which were tanks, uh, by the way, which played a huge role during World War II. And then my grandparents moved away, went to all kinds of army posts here, there, and everywhere, here and abroad, by the way, and eventually decided that they were going to come back after Eisenhower's presidency. Now, we have to note that he actually bought this property up here, the farm, during his presidency. So he was even using it, uh, in, especially in the last term of his office. That's sort of where I come into the picture, because um, after his presidency, my father came up to help him write his 
uh, White House memoirs, and I went to elementary school. I'm sorry to say they tore down Kefauver Elementary, <laughs> um, but I'm not taking it personally. I just want to let you know. And so I feel very close to this town and to this community uh, myself. Now, it is noteworthy that Dwight Eisenhower sat on the board of trustees of Gettysburg College. My brother sat on the board of trustees of Gettysburg College, and I sat on the board of trustees of Gettysburg College during Dr. Glassick's tenure as president. The connections run deep indeed, and I know that the president spoke on our campus on multiple occasions. So it's now 10 years since the Eisenhower Institute and Gettysburg College merged. What do you make of the connections? Well, I think it's I think it's going extraordinary extraordinarily well and I'm personally gratified that we are involving more and more students in the Eisenhower Institute programs. And we've got so much to work with. I mean, this is such an interesting time in our history. I think mostly because so many of the issues that we're looking at are long-term issues. And I feel strongly that we need to prepare students for um, addressing these issues farther out. By the time they come to power, actually, in our country, many of the things that we're worrying about now are going to be major areas of uh, concern or gratification if we get it right. I think there's no question that rising generations today have a seat at the table in a way they never have had before. And the Eisenhower Institute does such a superb job of giving our students the opportunity to get their hands on important issues. And one of the things I so admire about it, uh, driving back from your grandfather's orientation to the world, is a decidedly nonpartisan way of looking at these issues. Let's look at facts. Let's seek to understand those facts. Let's make good policy judgments. I've come to become very fond of the work of the Institute. But let's help people understand better a student experience. So I know you're actively involved with students, and I can see whenever I talk with you about this, your smile is broad and your face lights up. So give us an example of what you do with students and how you think they benefit from those experiences. Wow. Well, how they benefit from those experiences, in a way, we'll have to ask them. But if if, um, continuing to be in touch with students is any sign that they're getting something out of EI programs, and hopefully mine too, um, then I think we can feel that we're being successful because I, I myself have ongoing interaction with many students, quite a number of whom have already graduated from the college. And not to jump in a little bit, but I think when I was visiting you, you showed me a painting from a former student. Yeah. No, I'm very touched by that, and and certainly the students who have been in my program have shown me all kinds of uh, enormous consideration. So my particular uh, topic is strategy and leadership in transformational times, and I don't think you can have one without the other, frankly. Uh, I don't think you can be um, a top leader without having a strong strategic sense of how to move an issue from A to B to C to some kind of culminating goal. And we have undertaken all kinds of case studies, you might say. We certainly did, one year we did a a whole year on the rapidly changing environment in the energy field. Uh, Another year we studied the collapse of the Soviet Union and why, uh, what choices the West made, what choices um, Russia and the former Soviet Union made, what the strategic challenges were in both cases. And then I have also taken, I think, four groups to uh, the Normandy beaches. And the Normandy beaches, I just say, is, is the iconic beach. You could say the turning point, certainly, for the Western Allies. And it's a very evocative place, and I think it's had a big impact. Sounds a little bit like Gettysburg itself as you walk onto the battlefields and you understand what happened here. I've never been, but at some point you'll have to take me, Susan. Well, I'd love to do that. And I think the thing that is particularly striking for students, and it's kind of hard to remember, so much of the story of Normandy focuses on uh, older veterans. And we forget that actually it's a young person's story. The people who came on those beaches were the same age as our students here at Gettysburg College. And that strikes them very hard when they get there. And I think one of the things that uh, moves them always is is the idea of this um, fate-changing moment when people landed on those beaches and suddenly knew everything they had to know about themselves in an instant. Absolutely. It's, I think it's a very moving experience for both students and adults. 
And it's one example of the many things that students get to do through the Eisenhower Institute. And one of the reasons, again, I'm so excited about it. Uh, you said that um, a moment ago that it's important, in your view, for students to get a better understanding of the world that awaits them and the policy issues. Say more about that. And does that speak to a certain type of student, or do you see that as a broadly applicable skill? Well, I think that students are accustomed to thinking that they're just students. And what I like to do is to help them see what the projections are for 20 years from now and to help them understand that now is the time to prepare. We certainly did that on the uh, energy module uh, that I worked on. And last year, I spoke to the students very uh, pointedly about the strategic challenges that were underway. At the same time, we have fewer tools in our toolbox than we did, say, after World War II. What I mean by that is we simply don't have the money we used to have. Um, we're running uh, now trillion-dollar annual budget deficits, and this is going to mean that any strategic solutions we come up with are going to have to be extremely sophisticated and reliant more on smart thinking than on vast amounts of financial resources. Do you have a sense of what your students who have gone through your programs do when they graduate? Well, actually, I'm very proud of the fact that three or four of them have gone into the strategy area. And I heard from one student just last week uh, who's been put on the strategy committee uh, for a company that um, she's just joined. She was with me last year. And she uh, I'm so moved by the fact that she says she, she reads her notes before she okay. <laughs> that she, she got from last year before she goes into it. I think the real one of the uh, one of the many opportunities we have for the Eisenhower Institute is that we are able to give students a glimpse into the world that awaits them after they graduate. And it's a wonderful opportunity to mix both theoretical study and practical study as well. And in that sense, it really amplifies what Gettysburg College is doing generally. The Eisenhower Institute is one example of that, mm -hmm. but we are very much about making sure that we are preparing students for the world that awaits, and we do this in a hundred different ways, the Eisenhower Institute being one of the more prominent examples. So I was recently on the radio at WITF, and I was asked the following question about the Civil War. It seems more distant now to students and therefore a little bit less relevant. I suppose the same could be said increasingly of our students' perspective of World War II and your grandfather's service as president. I know what I said on WITF, but what would you say to that argument that the study of something that goes back 60, 70 years ago doesn't really have relevance today? Well... First of all, I would say that uh, World War II is always going to be a little easier to understand simply because there are videos and there are photographs. And you do have some of those from the Civil War, but not anything like the documentation that took place during World War II. I have found in taking students to Normandy, it has not been a limitation that it took place 75 years ago. And so everything that is historic requires some kind of imagination. But I think the principles of my grandfather's era are eerily contemporary. And I think that's what's so striking for me. I've, I've spent the last year working on a book, and what came out of this for me was just how resonant the issues are with what we're facing today. Say more, what do you see as the points of connection? Well, first of all, we have the impression that we came out of World War II uh, a united, victorious country. Yes, we came out of World War II as a victorious country, but certainly not a united one. The question of uh, whether or not the New Deal was going to continue, uh, whether or not uh, American business would be regarded with respect again because they were blamed largely for the Great Depression. There are all sorts of deep divides, labor unrest, a vast technological change that was uh, exacerbated and, and initiated actually by World War II itself. And all of these things are going on at the same time. My grandfather had a very hard time deciding whether or not to run for president. I mean, this agonizing decision went on for six whole years. And he didn't know uh, he was being courted by both political parties. And, you know, Bob, I would say that he was arguably um, the most nonpartisan president we've had since maybe some other military general was uh, a two-term president. And that only leaves us with perhaps George Washington. And we could certainly debate Ulysses S. Grant. But he, um, he didn't care much about what political party people came from. He was trying to create what he called the middle way. 
a road so broad that there could be a meeting place for consensus and reconciliation and all the other compromise. He worried a lot about the extremes uh, of the left and the right and the nihilists and the this and the that because he'd seen what the result was in Europe. This may be an impossible question to answer, but if he were alive today, what do you think he would seek to do to bridge those divides that are so much more pronounced now than they've been for a very long time in American society? Well, I'd say two things. First off is that he would work very hard to try to unite this country around some central ideas. That's how he conducted his eight-year presidency. And I think he would start right, right at the very beginning with setting standards for civil discourse. I live in Washington, D.C., where, you know, it gives me ready access to our Washington office there at the Eisenhower Institute. And it, it doesn't take a genius to know that we have, we are failing hugely in that regard. And I think uh, this is almost uh, universally underway. It's just a complete degradation of the way we talk to each other. I think you know this, but the Eisenhower Institute has begun sponsoring programs on our campus. The first happened just last weekend, really designed to help the community figure out how to talk about hard questions constructively, how to reach across political divides. We are a place that actually encourages the exchange of different ideas. That's fundamental to who we are as an institution. And so I'm looking forward to the Eisenhower Institute continuing to sponsor these programs between now and November 2020. As I've been fond of saying, Susan, I want us to have the opportunity to learn from and about the election, not to be divided by it. And I think that's a role that the Eisenhower Institute can distinctively play? Well, I think it's a terrific initiative. And uh, not only because I think it is completely in keeping with uh, Dwight Eisenhower's uh, view of uh, good leadership and uh, good leadership development, um, but there is a, I think there's a, another issue here too, which is learning how to talk to people is a skill. And I, I think there are many well-meaning people today who uh, are falling into this trap of personalizing and insulting people accidentally or otherwise, and they need to learn those skills again. And then I think the other thing that Dwight Eisenhower would do is he'd redefine leadership. Uh, we are now at a point in our history where the definition of leadership is staking out your territory, digging your heels in, and not moving an inch, least you look weak. Now, the generation that fought World War II knew perfectly well that if they hadn't compromised literally on an hourly basis, we wouldn't have won the war. The only guy who wasn't compromising was Adolf Hitler, and last time I checked, uh, we, we took care of that problem in 1945. So the dynamism of diversity, diverse strategic perspectives and diverse ways of looking at a problem really gave the Allies the enormous advantage during that war. And I think it's terrific that we're able to, you know, address those challenges and those opportunities head on. And in addition, I should note, we have the Garth White Leadership Center, which is very much seeking to inculcate the skills, the very skills that you've identified. And your point about diversity is something that matters to us enormously. We are seeking to ensure that we have as diverse a community as possible because we think we are stronger for that. And we know that we learn more by virtue of it. So a couple of more questions, Susan. One is, um, what advice would your grandfather give to students today? Oh, I think it's very clear that he would say there's lots to be optimistic about. Really, he was a huge optimist, even in the face of, um, you know, the 1968 riots and the sit-ins and the public disruption and the vitriolic way people related to each other in those days. He, he always remained as opt uh, optimistic all the way to the end. Boy, I admired that about him. So would you give students any different advice than your grandfather? No, I don't think so. I, I am trying very hard to um, stay cheerful in the face of all this. I do find um, the endless hand-wringing and the rest of it absolutely unproductive. I've sat in meetings in Washington where everybody says, well, that's off the table. So I raise my hand and say, well, let's put together a strategy to get it back on the table. You know, this kind of passive, it's all too hard type thing um, is not is not worthy of our country. Our country has always stepped up to the plate, and now's the time to do it. 
And as you know, there are a thousand different ways to make a difference. And you don't necessarily need to solve the big problem by solving the big problem. You start by solving some of the smaller problems. Exactly. And part of what we do here is we give students the opportunity to solve big problems and solve small problems simultaneously, whether it's through our Center for Public Service or through other activities that happen. You've written a book uh, or about to release a book. Say more about that. What was the experience like? What's it about? Wow. I, you know, uh, what was the experience like? Well, it was pretty intense, I have to say. And uh, I didn't realize how affecting it was. I was 17 when my grandfather died. I spent a huge amount of time with him when he was here at Gettysburg. And um, wow, I had to say goodbye again. That was pretty hard. Having said that, I do not wander in and out of the pages of this book that much because it's really about his biggest decisions. The book's going to be ca uh, be called uh, How Ike Led, uh, The Principles Behind His Biggest Decisions. And so I kind of take apart um, the various elements that were under consideration as he looked at some very uh, big domestic and geopolitical uh, challenges. You've written other books. Was this harder? I think on, uh, on an emotional level it was because, first of all, it is so resonant for me. The, the chapter about uh, Joseph McCarthy and uh, the pernicious influence he had on the political environment uh, in the United States, uh, that, of course, has some resonance uh, domestically. And, and the deep divisions that he spoke to, you know, we have that, that same feeling. And then uh, there were many uh, issues about technological change. He loved his scientists, you know. He really did. He, he uh, made extraordinary use of the scientific community in, um, you know, uh, setting a, a set of standards and goals for um, these rapid technological changes. And you can just see so much of what's going on uh, in these years. So that was a little hard because I wish we had him back. <laughs> but, you know, um, I'm really glad I did it. I'm, I'm glad I did it. I once wrote a book on um, my grandmother's life, which was really a story of the two of them. So we could just call this the, the bookend. Well, I'm looking forward to reading it. Uh, Susan, I don't know how to say thank you enough. Thank you for this conversation. Thank you for introducing the Eisenhower Institute and Gettysburg and helping that marriage work. Thank you for what you do with our students. I've talked to so many of them and they find that engagement so remarkable and so uplifting and inspiring and eye-opening. So thank you for today. Thank well, you for it's everything. It's my pleasure. Let me conclude with a slice of life at Gettysburg College. We're recording this just a few days before Thanksgiving, and just a few days ago, I was so pleased to participate for the first time in a heartwarming Gettysburg tradition, Servo Thanksgiving. For those of you who don't know about this tradition, the faculty and staff serve students a full Thanksgiving dinner, turkey, stuffing, and all the fixings. This is the time of year where everyone is feeling the weight of having been at their studies for nearly three straight months, and the dinner had the students with huge smiles on their faces and very full stomachs by evening's end. It was a great event. In fact, the dinner is such a powerful draw that as I walked to Penn Hall before 8 a.m., students had already begun lining up. Mind you, the doors to Servo didn't open until 4.30, and it's starting to get chilly in the mornings here. Gettysburg, great in action, to be sure. Parents, we pride ourselves on giving students a top-notch education. I have to admit that we have failed in one respect. We have a long way to go before we can declare competency in our students' turkey carving skills. We'll see if we can improve next year. Let me end on a more serious note. As I think about the season, I feel truly thankful for the chance to be part of this community, to see the passion and dedication of our students, and to work with our remarkable faculty to bring our educational mission to life. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this conversation and want to be notified of future episodes, please subscribe to Conversations Beneath the Cupola by visiting gettysburg.edu. If you have a topic or suggestion for a future podcast, please email news at gettysburg.edu. Thank you. Until next time.